Okay, so this is to address some questions that Alex asked me. Um, I haven't read them ahead of time, so it's going to be kind of a, you know, off the cuff here. But um, first question, what pre-controls do the kits that you sell have to be safe for using at home? Uh, well, actually, the answer to that is um, two parts. The first part is uh, you're not supposed to use it at home. Uh, I mean, that's the short of it. So we, we have a partner network um, of professional body piercers and some doctors. And we strongly encourage you to take the kit to that professional. They have everything they need to do it. Uh, it's definitely not a DIY kit, and it's definitely um, not really easy to do it yourself if you chose to. I mean, part of the process is you're supposed to, um, you know, tent the skin up and then, you know, to achieve proper depth and all this. And you really can't do that yourself unless you have three hands. So um, it's not really meant to be done safely at home. It's very, very, very difficult to do safely at home. Uh, that said, uh, the testing that we do on our chips and all the sterilization procedures uh, is industry standard. We use eogas sterilization. We use other components like gauze and things that are pre-sterilized from their manufacturing facility and lock controlled and all of that stuff. So, um, <clears throat> in fact, I mean, I'm, I'm going to reiterate it again here. Um, I've seen a lot of um, procedures, DIY procedures, and even some uh, assisting procedures where people who are not professionals are are doing it or either doing it themselves or assisting, and they always, always, always cross-contaminate. Um, you know, I see it all the time. They, you know, un open the drape, for example, and then like whoo, put their hands across it to flatten it out. Well, you just contaminated the entire sterile field, the entire thing. So now when you put your sterile materials on it, they're also contaminated. You, right from the word go, you've contaminated everything and you know, you might as well be doing it in a dirty back alley. Uh, so just please do not do it at home. <laughs> that's that's all there is to it. Uh, in addition to that, I mean, the partner network that we've built is, is good, but it's definitely uh, not great. So one of the things we're going to do is uh, we're, we're looking at bringing on a network manager, somebody from the body piercing and body modification industry who can just manage the network. If you buy a product and there's no piercer next to you or professional or a partner in, in your area, contact the network manager. There'll be a very easy way to do that. They will find you somebody. And um, so we're, we're trying to transition this uh, whole thing away from DIY. Um, you know, not just because, you know, we, we, we want professionals to be involved and do a good job for safety, but also, you know, the if it were physically possible to do it yourself with proper training at home in a way that was safe, then we would explore it. But Nobody who buys the stuff is properly trained, um, or at least not that I've seen. Um, and again, doing it yourself without a third hand, it's extremely difficult to do properly. So, you know, we're 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 gonna definitely build out the partner network and make it much more easy for customers to go to a professional partner or or have one located for them, uh, and then you know make those arrangements. So, that's the answer to that. Um, <clears throat> how long can a person carry the chip inside the body? Um, life, for life. Um, whether or not the chip is going to work properly for an entire human lifespan of, say, 100 years uh, depends, and it depends on a few things. So uh, one of the things about microchips is they have something called a data retention period, and that is essentially when you write data to a memory block, whether it's magnetic media or flash ROM or EEPROM or whatever, um, the amount of time that that memory component can hold that signal uh, properly, because uh, everything degrades, right? So you write magnetic uh, media, write to magnetic media, that magnetic charge will slowly decay. And then, you know, there'll be a point at which there's no differentiation, differentiation between signal and noise, and then you've lost the data. So data retention is a big deal. And there are chips, most chips um, out there in the in the implant, um, NFC, RFID implant space are about 10 year data retention. So when you write data to a memory block, if you're expecting it to last, you know, 50 years, it's probably not going to do that. And so um, we do have other chips. So VivoKey, on the VivoKey side of things, we do crypto uh, cryptobionic implants, cryptography in vivo, those chips uh, have 50-year um, data retention. So, you know, you write them, write some data like keys or something, it's going to last 50 years at least. And then you know, beyond that, probably it'll last, you know, another couple decades, but it's only, it's guaranteed for 50 years. And then you have something called um, write cycle count. So how many times can you write to, uh, write data to a memory block before it starts kind of l not being able to hold the data properly? Because uh, every time you write, it kind of has a little physical effect on the memory block and it degrades a little. So 
the right circle counts vary, but the, the lowest one in most RFID and NFC implants is about 100,000 right cycles, which is great. I mean, I don't know anybody who's going to write 100,000 times to their implant. It's just not going to happen. But if you combine those two things, so uh, let's just take the XNT, for example, as a 10-year data retention per memory block, 100,000 right cycles per memory block. If you were to write to it once a day, it would last like, I think, 39 years or something like that. If you And if you extend the data retention period, so uh, data retention is how long it lasts since the last write to that memory block. So uh, if you wrote to it once every 10 years, right, you'd still be guaranteed data integrity and it would last, you know, million years plus, I think. I don't know, quick math, but anyway, a long time. And so <clears throat> the... Um, the next question here, what type of actions can you do with your chips? How can you improve your, how can it improve your life? I'm assuming. Um, well, I use, you know, I put this one in my left hand. It's an XCM before the XCM was a product. Um, that is, you know, it's been in there since 2005. I've used it um, every day. I mean, at least on average, there might be days where I don't use it, but I use it a lot. And so uh, I use it on different access control things around the house. Um, I get into my garage with it. I have a little access controller that reads it and opens the door. Um, XNT here, that in, in my right hand, I use that every day as well to get in the house and other access control things. Uh, recently put a Spark in my left hand. That's a VivoKey product. And I'm starting to use that now just um, for developing the, further the, the VivoKey platform and, and doing usability testing and things like that. But I, I, I see a transition from... Um, all these other implants to more VivoKey products because the the Dangerous Things products uh, like the XNT, XCM, the RFID and NFC transponders, they are what I call personal scope devices. So they're, they're not secure devices. Um, so you really can't build on them. You can't build a business model beyond um, you know, for the for the user, uh, for user's utility, you can't build a business model beyond just a personal scope, your house, your computer, your car. You can't say, well, we're going to manage, you know, like website logins or we're going to, you know, manage uh, banking or pay anything like that. It's impossible because it's not secure. So, you know, the utility is really limited to access type things in my personal scope, the things that are my devices, my, my purview. So, uh, when we start talking about logging into, for example, websites or things that are third party or, you know, introducing web APIs or crypto challenges, things like that, uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, that's all in the VivoKey domain. And so, you know, we're we're working now, we've got the platform MVP launched, very simple. Uh, we got the Spark product out there, also very simple AES key uh, system for identifying the chip and confirming its validity, uh, you know, authentic, uh, authorizing it and authenticating that chip itself. So. Uh, we're about to open up the web API for VivoKey, which is going to allow things like plugins to be made for identity provider services. And, you know, you can log into WordPress, you can log into third-party sites if they choose to integrate. So you see these sites where it's like logging with Facebook, logging with Twitter. A third option could be logging with your VivoKey. Uh, you know, that's, we're going to have uh, standard identity services uh, provided through it. So I see that whole space opening up. And then VivoKey is also working on hardware releases for that personal scope. So vehicles doors, computers, things like that. So, you know, right now I'm using kind of a plethora of different devices. I see in the future, uh, definitely moving more toward the VivoKey domain and kind of touching more things, my personal space, as well as online and other digital services, you know, it's gonna be quite quite handy. Um, next question, what was the motivation that made you start investigating biohacking, specifically implantation of chips under the skin? Uh, so in 2005, I was working for uh, medical clinics doing IT consulting and managed system environments for, for clinics. Um, I was in a basement um, basement office, and the only way in and out of that thing was either a lot of stairs uh, or an emergency door that was literally right behind my desk. And so I would go in and out of that emergency door, but the problem is that being an emergency door, you weren't allowed to leave it unlocked. Uh, it had a like crash bar exit, but from the outside, it was not meant for ingress. It was only meant for escape, right, from the building, emergency exit. So um, <clears throat> if I had got up and left and left my keys, which I did often, I was locked out. And that was fine during the day because I could just go around and come down all the stairs and go back to my office. But if I'm working late or it's 2 a.m. or I do server work or something, I go out to my car to get something, uh, you know, and it was a lot of calls to maintenance. I was standing outside the building. And it was really, really irritating for me and maintenance. And uh, sometimes they just wouldn't come. So I just have to 
you know, sit there for a while and figure out how to ha break into my car, hotwire it. That that gave me the, uh, you know, so I could drive home. That gave me the, the idea of like, there's got to be a way for the door to just know that it's me. And so I looked at, you know, biometric systems, fingerprint readers, iris scanners. They were clunky and expensive back then. They're not much better today. Um, the the sensors are not well suited for outdoors, outside doors. You know, maybe inside it would be okay, but um, you know, in Seattle it's rainy and it's just not it's, it's not good. So I thought, well, you know, those badges, badge systems. Beep, put the badge up to the door, beeps open. That's a great system, but again, I would probably leave the card. It doesn't solve my problem. It just changes the type of key I'm dealing with. So um, <clears throat> kind of thought about it more and realized that dogs and cats were um, getting chipped with RFID. So I made some calls, found um, a company that made them. They made other chips that were in the same glass containers with the same materials, um, biosafe materials, but not animal chips. <clears throat> and then I did some research and said, yeah, I want I want some of those. They were EM4102 chips to be exact. And so, you know, got them on order, talked to my doctor who was also a client because I was doing IT consulting for, for doctors. Um, you know, we, we talked it over and he said, yeah, that's a great idea. So he put it in and I had, I built an access control system for my door for like, I don't know, a hundred bucks or something like that. And, um, that was it. And I was using it happily for a long time. Um, ended up writing a, a book called RFID toys a year after that, uh, cause there was a lot of media coverage, but not a lot of interest in do other people doing it as well. There was just kind of media coverage. So, um, <clears throat> but by the time 20, you know, 2010 or so rolled around, there was, um, the maker movement had started to catch fire and, you know, people were more and more interested in RFID for their hobbyist projects and home projects and also implants. So by 2013, I was like, you know, we got to, we got to either I need to ignore all these emails or, uh, you know, or I need to wrap a business model around it and just do that. And so that's what uh, the birth of dangerous things uh, was because it just became popular enough that people were just asking questions all over the place. And then they were researching, you know, online, where by that time there were videos of other people who had seen what I did and they just like grabbed any old transponder that, you know, looked halfway like it was safe and just like rammed it in their body any old way. So there were some real problems with people and safety. So that was the other idea is like, if I can do this as a business uh, and not just trying to like advise people online, which is a bad idea anyway, um, <clears throat> you know, then we can ensure safe materials. The things that we sell are going to be safe. We can test them and try to come up with a procedure guide. And so that procedure guide, the first the first six months or so was it was all based on this procedure guide, which is a DIY approach. And so that's probably where this idea of a DIY uh, implant came from. But very quickly we started having conversations with not just doctors but also uh, body piercers who were like, "Hey, what is this? Why are you letting people? Why are you telling people to jab needles in their body? This is this should be done by a professional." And like you're you're right. Let's, let's, let's partner up. Let's team up here and you can be, you know, installers and we'll sell the thing. They'll bring it to you. And so that's where the installer network kind of started. So, um, you know, beyond that, it just, you know, it kind of grew and grew and grew. And, and now we're trying to get to the point where we're bringing on, you know, a network manager to again, like manage all the stuff and get people on board. So, um, what's the next thing here? Do you think that the future of this technology will be used by most people? And if so, it'll be used to control the population or free, an open source technology used to control the population. Hold on, let me rehear this. Do you think that in the future, this technology will be used by most people? Uh, it or something like it, probably. Um, and if so, will it be used to control the population? Or will it be free and open source technology? So <clears throat> those are two different things. You can use open source technology to control the population. That is not, <laughs> free and open source does not mean uh, free in terms of liberty. So just to be clear, um, the, uh, the idea that pe most people will use this kind of technology. Yes, I think so in one form or another. And that's simply because, you know, tool use is nothing new. We've been doing it for millennia and human beings are tool users. Our tools are just now small enough and safe enough and, uh, effective enough to go in the body and be used that way rather than picking up like a cell phone or a smartphone or whatever. Um, the idea that the human body's capabilities can be augmented to do things that it couldn't do biologically, like cryptography, like, you know, maybe we could make cells do mathematics somehow chemically, maybe, but that's a long way off. So the easier way is to make an implant do it and, and be able to perform those uh, feats of cryptography. So. Like a biometric is all analog. It's reading analog details about your body that anybody can read. It's not secure. 
Um, I mean, I could go on and on about bio, biometrics and how terrible they are. Uh, and if you want to talk about controlling a population, we can get into biometrics because if you look at China um, and even the UK, it's a surveillance state and like other areas, but biometrics are terrible for individuals and great for everyone else. And I mean that by like, you, a biometric system that's amazing at identifying a person is still not secure enough at authenticating that person. You, you know, you can pick faces out of a crowd, you can identify people through a number of methods, but, uh, which is terrible for the individual because you, they're all passive systems, cameras, gate analysis. You can walk through a, 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 an arch that sucks in all the air and analyzes you from your sweat molecules and the way you smell. I mean, the, the ways of identifying a person uh, through biometrics is plentiful. And that sucks because I don't have control over the systems. You know, it's like me as an individual, that's all these other external things that are just sampling things about me. And to avoid or to uh, avoid being identified by those systems, I have to radically change my appearance such that I will be uh, easily identified as somebody who's doing that by others around me and also by those systems to be like, there is a person wearing a crazy face mask or like crazy makeup. I mean, you're just not going to do that. It's, it's, so you cannot escape the future in which everybody will be identified everywhere. The real terrible thing about biometrics is that as good as those systems are, they're not designed for your security. <laughs> they're designed for everyone else's security or whatever their purpose is. So, you know, you can see this in, in situations like where police are taking 2D fingerprints from, you know, all their records and then printing 3D fingers and thumbs and then opening phones, cell phones. Um, you know, people are posting videos like this and I'm moving my head and then an AI can take that and reconstruct a three-dimensional model of my face and you can present that to a facial recognition system and get, and, and so again, it's, it's the most terrible um, type of technology to be proliferated, which is zero benefit for you as an individual because you can't use it, it's not secure enough to be used as authentication, but 100% accurate at identifying you anywhere you go and everywhere, that's terrible. And that's, you know, unfortunately people aren't getting that. And so, you know, we see systems everywhere. Even if you go to Disneyland and you have a three day pass, you have to submit your thumbprint or fingerprints to link your biometrics to that pass because the idea is that they don't want you to buy a three day pass, go for one day and then sell the remaining two days to somebody else for cheap. So they their their system of doing this was fing fingerprint readers. And they don't declare it anywhere, not in the tickets, not anywhere. So if you've spent you know ten grand to get your family all flown to Disney World and get the hotel set up and everything, and you get to the front gate and they ask you for your fingerprint, if you don't submit it, you you've wasted ten grand. And so people just capitulate. They just do it. And now Disney Corporation has copies of your fingerprints with no user agreements, no, no idea of what they do with that data, how long they keep it. You know, they have your full name and everything. And then, so, so again, biometrics, totally beneficial for corporations and governments and everybody else, terrible for you um, as an individual, unfortunately. So free and open source technology, I will say that, um, you know, we do as much as we can to keep things open uh, and open source. So all the applets, for example, we have two products in VivoKey. Um, one is the VivoKey Flex One. It's a Java card secure element uh, NFC platform. So you can run little Java card applets on on the chip in Vivo. You can deploy those applets to the chip in Vivo. So, um, you know, we have PGP, uh, OTP code uh, generator and two-factor authenticator, a bunch of other stuff. And so those applets are all open source. Uh, we can't open source the operating system of the chip because it's not even open to us. It's um, closed and it's from the chip manufacturer. So as much as possible, we try to be open source, um, but that doesn't really guarantee, uh, you know, it, it, again, I'll say again, open source does not guarantee it won't be leveraged against you as an individual uh, or society at large. Uh, Okay, what we have to do if we want to implant ourselves with a chip without knowing about science, biology, and medicine. Well, actually, that's the idea of VivoKey is we want to be kind of like the plug and play option of implants. Uh, crypto security, we basically want to take an, uh, an advanced technology that's very useful for personal security and, and privacy and make it something that is straightforward uh, and, you know, you don't need to know all the stuff about it. The partner network for installing with doctors and, and piercers is going to make the installation process something uh, that's easy so you don't need to know about all that stuff. Um, and then using it, we want to make sure that 
that uh, use case is there and, and the user experience is good and easy and you can leverage things. And, and through that, we want to break the, the, the situation where that arises all the time where you see an inverse relationship between convenience and security. So something is secure, it's usually a pain in the ass to use. If something is um, convenient, it's usually completely insecure. So we wanna break that uh, relationship and we wanna make something secure or more secure because it is convenient. And I'll give the example of my, my the door in my house or my office. So I'm, I'm, I work a lot in the garage, as you can see. I go in and out of the house a lot. So the front door of the house uh, has a, a lock that reads my implant. And if I had to use keys to get in and out of that, I mean, I must go in and out of there 20 times a day, if, if, if not more. So if I'm going in and out, in and out, in and out, then um, if I had to use keys every time to unlock the door, then I would just not lock it. I would just leave it unlocked, unlock it in the morning, go in and out, and then at the night, lock it. That's not secure, that's convenient. And so by having an implant and by the, the, the use of it being, um, you know, my user experience being almost the same as just grabbing the doorknob and twisting, instead, I present my tag to the lock just above it, it unlocks, then I grab the doorknob and I twist it. That Because it's such a normal, convenient behavior with an implant, uh, I choose to use the auto locking feature of the door so that when it closes, it locks itself behind me. That is security because of the convenience that implants provide. <clears throat> uh, okay. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Uh, I suppose you already know the transhumanism or posthumanism culture about human evolution. Regarding this, you can still consider consider yourself human or cyborg. Um, well, human and cyborg. So the, the the question about whether or not you are human or, or will we change ourselves so much that we cease to be human, I think um, there are certain key key things about humanity that is, as long as those are retained, your physical form is irrelevant. And the, the thing that needs to be retained, in my opinion, is curiosity, uh, the, the will and drive to always improve, improve your capabilities, improve your understanding of the universe. Um, and I've added a third one recently, <clears throat> and that is empathy. Uh, our ability to understand, you know, situations from other points of view, other people's situations and feelings, Without empathy, we just become kind of murderous killing machines, even without cyborg parts. Um, you know, empathy is so critical to um, the human experience and also the human um, contribution to the universe. We, without it, it's just, you know, consuming and processing and, uh, you know, uh, export of those waste products is all we do. And, and so empathy kind of gives us the ability to um, make impacts in the universe for reasons other than uh, the personal uh, gain. And so that's, I think, the important thing. So as long as we retain those things, we'll always be human, uh, even if we become completely digitized beings. As long as those things exist, I think we'll, we'll still uh, qualify as human beings. Um, let's see, I suppose you already, oh yeah, that's already read it. Also, could you send us information about how many kits you've sold and what places and, and is more sold? So <clears throat> we sell kits all over the world. We mostly um, ship to English speaking or where English is common uh, countries. So EU, Europe, uh, Australia, North America, some in Central America, uh, but we're really trying to open up uh, the Asian and South American markets. We've got people in interested in distributing there. So um, we're, we're, we're trying to go you know, truly worldwide with it. Um, as far as how many kits and things, I, I don't have exact numbers, but I think the last time I looked, it was close to 60,000 or so, something like that over the last many years. Um, and then of course there's other people that are trying to get into the implant game. Uh, so far there's nothing very interesting. It's just kind of copycats of, of our XNT products and our XEM product. But, um, and I don't have any numbers for that, but uh, yeah, it's it's growing for sure. And let's see, last question. Do you know someone in Barcelona or surroundings could speak with us about the topic or where, you, where to go if we want to implant ourselves with NFC chips without knowing about medicine? So um, there are a couple people in Barcelona, actually, and we're trying to get them on the partner network. <laughs> so uh, body piercers. And so, you know, they're familiar with the technology and we're trying to kind of get them locked down as partners and, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, proceed from there. But um, as far as like customers or anything, we don't um, share that information. We're pretty, um, we're pretty strict on no spamming and no, um, you know, sharing of data. So privacy. Um, if I can think of somebody who, who wants to uh, uh, talk about it, then I could, um, 
I could probably uh, ask them if you if they'd be interested and give them your contact information and go from there. And that is the last question. Great. So hopefully that's all you need. And if you need anything else, let me know.